Welcome to the webinar on homeopathy for mother and ba baby. My name is Nicole Duelli, and I'm here as the moderator today with the lovely presenter, Robin Pollock. This is a webinar that's part of a complete series. If you missed uh, the first couple of sessions, uh, just know that you can always go back and listen to them. So the first two sessions were all about uh, pregnancy and problems that you can encounter in pregnancy. So if you've missed those, please go back and watch them at our website for homeopathycanada.org and look under the webinar section, look for the baby, mother and baby logo and you'll find it there. Now, our organization for Homeopathy Canada, of course, serves to educate anyone interested in keeping natural remedies at home and also learning when it would be wise to go and see a homeopath. We also really love to share all the benefits of homeopathy as an integrative medicine. So if you have an inspiring story to tell, please send it along because it really does help us sort of share the work we do uh, as homeopaths and then people know uh, how it can be helpful for them. Now this series on homeopathy for mother and baby is all about pregnancy, birth and the baby's first year. At, in this section, these next two webinars are going to be about the birth process, labor, and the mother, what she can do after birth as well. And it is a series that is based on a book. And the book is Miranda Castro's Homeopathy for Pregnancy, Birth, and the Baby's First Year. Uh, there are two versions. So um, the other one's called Mother and Baby, I believe, or homeopathy for mother and baby, but it's exactly the same book. Now you don't need to actually purchase the book to join us and enjoy the sessions here. Uh, just, it's a great resource. So if you do plan on using uh, some of these remedies for yourself, or if you're a doula, uh, it's a great resource or a midwife even, it's a great resource book. Now, uh, part two, and then I just wanted to briefly mention, we will have a third part, which is all about the baby's first year. And uh, please join us for those as, as well. Now, I just want to clarify that um, this book is a beginner's book. And this course, of course, this webinar is a beginner-based webinar. Of course, everyone's welcome to join. I know there are homeopaths here, and I'm always keen to join these as well. Um, but know that it is uh, it's kind of a basic uh, beginner type webinar. And uh, we do expect that you continue to see your uh, health care provider, your midwife, for any problems that you may encounter, and just for regular uh, checkups. Um, these webinars are not intended to replace your homeopath or your midwife's advice or your healthcare provider's advice. And finally, I wanted to mention as well, if you are joining us from afar, uh, as we've had people join us from afar before, you know, way far, even further than Canada, and this is in the middle of the night for you, even though we do love you for joining us in the middle of the night, know that you can always watch the webinar later at a time that might suit you. And please do share the webinars. Uh, as my kids used to say, sharing is caring. So uh, please do share. Now, um, the, the last thing I want to say before I introduce Robin is that when, uh, if you have a question, we can't see you. So please do um, type in the chat box or rather uh, the question and answer box is even better than the chat box just because sometimes that with the chats, uh, I, I can miss uh, some of the uh, questions that come up. I will be keeping an eye on it for Robin. So I, I might interrupt you, Robin, okay, if there's a question that comes up and, um, and then we'll, we'll uh, answer those questions as they come. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce Robin Pollock. She is an honors graduate and fellow of the Canadian College of Homeopathic Medicine and a registered member of the College of Homeopaths of Ontario. Now that's a big deal because Ontario is actually the first province to regulate homeopaths. So you guys are trailblazers over there in Ontario. 
Uh, she is also a member and I know a board member of the North American Society of Homeopaths. And of course, she's also a board member of uh, for Homeopathy Canada. And we so appreciate what she does here with us. Before switching careers, Robin was extensively trained and practiced uh, clinical group and gestalt psychotherapies. And she contributed, she's contributed several articles to the American Homeopaths. Some of you who are homeopaths may be well familiar with that journal. It's well respected in the homeopathic profession. She's also taught a lot of seminars and webinars. Some of you have, may, may have seen her um, topics on For Homeopathy Canada. And some of the topics are like the history of the repertory, anxiety in children, eating disorders, uh, obstetrics even. And just recently, um, we did one on, on pandemics together, Robin and I, and uh, she uh, offered one on sleep disorders that was really interesting. And of course, you can go to forhomeopathycanada.org and look at that one if you're interested. All right, Robin, so away you go. Thank you so much for doing this for us today. Oh, for, and for, you know, when you were mentioning my articles, I have one coming up in hpeffy.com. Al Wonderful. Al yeah, I have, a, I have a new one coming up. It was one of my papers from school, one of my like 40 page papers, but he took it. So <laughs> fabulous. What's, what's the subject? Uh, what is this? Oh, oh sexual, uh, sexuality, uh, homeopathic remedies oh, and sexuality. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Maybe and I did it, I did it really tongue in cheek. Like it's got a lot of little sassa to it. So <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So for people I'll be looking for that. Yeah. For hpethy.com, anybody can join and you can see tons and tons of articles about homeopathy. So that'll be in August, I believe it's being published. Okay. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Nicole and I, as you know, are an intrepid duo. Um, she's my Batman to uh, my Robin. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so she'll be chiming in and we'll be kind of bantering back and forth and making the class a little bit more dynamic. So, all right, let's get going. So as uh, Nicole said, this is based on Miranda Castro's book. So I just felt it was important to uh, show you a picture of Miranda so to give her proper credit where credit is due. So uh, a lot of what is going to be in this uh, class will be from her book. And then there'll be some supplementation as well. All right. And so this is uh, what we're doing. We call this, we call these the three trimesters. Now we're into the second trimester. Today, I will be doing um, birth complaints. So medical interventions, postpartum hemorrhage and retained placenta. And, um, and then I'll also be looking at some of the mother complaints of the mother. I hate the word uh, mother uh, complaints um, because it sounds like, you know, you're, I don't want to use the word B I T C H ing about something, but uh, that's just the way it's it's in medical lingo. And then we'll be looking at some of the things that happen uh, as soon as the mother gives birth, the lochia and prolapse, and some breastfeeding issues. And then next week, um, Nicole will be doing her side of it. So she'll also be going back to doing some birth complaints, labor, pain, and emotional and, uh, aspects, and exhaustion. And then she'll be doing some of the mother stuff, the healing after labor. Again, the mental emotional. Um, and exhaustion. Okay, so today we're going to do my stuff. So some of the birth complaints of these beautiful, beautiful babies who look very healthy and uh, it's good crying. The crying is good. You don't want to, you don't, my, my first son came out of me completely limp because they had to put so many, I had an emergency section and they had so many drugs in me that he came out totally limp. So all that crying is health and how frightening energy. Yes, it was my, my husband said it was his worst mm -hmm. moment ever. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is looking at some of the wonderful medical uh, in, interventions that are in labor. We all would love to have a natural childbirth with absolutely no interventions, but honest to God, these things can be absolutely life-saving for both the mother and the child. So we have to pay them respect, but we also have to rec recognize that sometimes these interventions will cause some problems. And lo and behold, homeopathy is there to help you through these little mini conditions so that you can go and start taking care of your baby right away. Okay, so although they uh, they are, you know, life saving at times, uh, they can also be physically and emotionally traumatic for everybody. So not giving birth naturally you know, can sometimes be in type, interpreted by the mother as a failure. And she feels that the wonderful experience of giving birth has been taken from her. And so that's a pretty sad kind of thing, you know, that you have this, you have this notion of how grand and wonderful it's going to be. You know, I brought my Bach music into the beautiful <laughs> delivery room. Exactly. 
Yeah. The second one was also an emergency and like within three seconds, you know, goodbye Bach, goodbye everything straight to <laughs> emergency operating room. So I know that. it's so common too. I think it's really common. Yeah. Yeah. So it can have emotional consequences, of course, and it could lead to kind of like even a depression or sometimes even an indifference towards the baby. So you have to weigh, unfortunately, it can often be very quickly the pros and cons of medical interventions. Uh, ultimately, what is safest for all is what's really paramount. So you really have to, you know, I remember the doctor saying to me, if you were my wife, I'd be straight, I'd be cutting you open right now. And so, you know, whenever they say that to you, you, okay, fine, whatever you think is right. <laughs> So homeopathic treatment for both the physical sequelae as well as the emotional ones uh, will bring about recovery much more rapidly and much more completely on all levels. Okay, so here are some typical medical interventions. When I say, what do you mean by medical interventions in labor? You can obviously see the forceps. You see a lovely episiotomy. I didn't give you, I gave you a plastic model. So <laughs> I've been looking at enough damaged breasts today. You'll see them later in this. So I didn't need to give you the episiotomy. So here are some- Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> medical I <interview>. appreciate it. <laughs> so there's obviously the internal examination. There can be induction. Sometimes the, pre the pregnancy, the, the labor is not going as it needs and you have to give some oxytocin. You have to do some things to try to get the mother to, uh, to dilate, for example. There could be breaking of the waters. I had to have that done for me for the second time. Uh, there can be a catheterization, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Certainly during some of the interventions, you have to put a tube into the urethra of the mother to make sure that none of the urine is getting onto the baby as, as because it's so close, right? We're all in the same yeah. part of, uh, of the, the woman's body. Then there can be that episiotomy, which is, uh, you know, a tear. Now, Miranda in her book discusses how a tear is actually more difficult to stitch than an episiotomy. So a natural tear is more difficult, but it is easier to heal. And therefore, many women are preferring mm -hmm. to risk a tear than to be cut. So I found that interesting in the book. That's something I, I did not know. There can be that forceps or a vacuum delivery. And then there is also cesarean section. So let's go into it. Since the cesarean section is really one of the most common uh, procedures, let's, let's go a little bit deeper into it. All right. Now, what could be some of the causes of needing a cesarean section? Well, you could have a very small pelvis or you could have a malformed pelvis. Obviously, everything has to loosen up. All the ligaments have to open up in order for the pelvis to open up. And if you have a small one or if there's something uh, you know, uh, malformed about the pelvis, you might need to have a cesarean section. Now, there might be something called placenta previa, and that's when a low-lying placenta Okay, so imagine the placenta and it's low lying. So it's partially or it's totally covering the cervix. So it's easy to understand. We have a blockage now. The vagina, vaginal opening is not available. So you can see how the baby can come out. That's called placenta previa. You could have a very large baby. So, you know, you might have a 12, 10 to 12 pound baby. You could have a smaller mother or narrow mother and very, very difficult to come out. You can have the awkward positioning of a baby. So, you know, we're always trying to, you know, could be an elbow in the wrong place or it could be a breach, a double or a double footling breach like I had with my son. That's not awkward. That was an impossible position. You could have cervix not dilating after a long labor. You could have the baby could be in distress. So you might have a situation where this, this baby needs to come out now. And the only way to do it is to grab them, cut open the mother and bring them up real quickly. Now, the mother could have eclampsia. Now, what is that? Eclampsia is a situation where there's high blood pressure in a pregnant woman, and this could lead to convulsions. And this can be a very, very dire situation that can lead to coma and even death. And I don't know if anybody here has watched uh, Downton Abbey, but there is an episode where um, Sybil uh, has eclampsia during the pregnancy and she starts to convulse and the two doctors are busy arguing about who knows medicine more than the other one wasn't a pretty, was not a pretty scene. And there could be genital herpes. So obviously, you know, especially if the mother is in an active case outbreak of the genital herpes, you do not want the baby coming through the vaginal canal and being exposed to those pathogens. Yeah. And then you could have a, a lot of hemorrhaging. All of a sudden the mother could be hemorrhaging and you got to get that baby out of there right away so we can start sewing up the mom. So a C-section can also be elective. Those are a lot of emergency situations, but it can be elective. It can be planned in advance. A lot of women do that. And especially when a condition is known to preclude a natural birth, or it can be an emergency, which is often decided after the onset of labor because of an unanticipated complication. Now, C-sections are performed under epidural 
or even general anesthesia, not as frequently. Uh, that might be more from the past. I know, I think when my mother gave birth, she was asleep for both of them and it wasn't even a C-section. So long time ago. Interesting. Yeah, epidurals use less drugs and it's healthier for everybody. Um, let me just move your picture down. There we go. I have some notes here. Um, now a catheter, we talked about a catheter, right, as one of the medical procedures. So a catheter is inserted into the urethra during the procedure and homeopathy that now often there are problems just from the catheterization. Uh, you know, there could be a cystitis that it develops, there could be a burning in the urethra uh, when you have to pee afterwards. So homeopathy has some wonderful, wonderful remedies for any consequences from catheterization. And of course, there could be lots of remedies addressing all of the incisions, okay? There could be superficial just on the outside, and then the deeper ones that go deep into the uterus. Uh, and these are beautifully effective. And yes, to answer your questions, we will be covering them tonight. Let me see, I've lost my, there we go. So what are some of the remedies that we might see uh, for medical interventions? Well, the first one everyone would think of because we're thinking of a lot of physical injury might be Arnica, okay? It's the first remedy for any injury during pregnancy or labor. It's the first one that you're gonna go to, you're gonna just give it right away, see how it works. If it doesn't work, we'll switch to something else, but often you'll wanna start with the Arnica. You'll have bruised, sore, pains and swelling. Now for people who've been to all of our talks before, Arnica is Arnica, whether we're talking about uh, pregnancy or whether we're talking that you took a fall down some stairs. If you have bruised, sore, inflammation, think to Arnica. Now, what are some of the emotions? We're always trying to tie together the emotional concomitant. It's not just enough just to have the physical. If you can tie an emotional feeling that is accompanying this new acute situation and it matches the remedy that you know, then you're very confident that you can give that remedy. In this case with Arnica, the classic uh, presentation is, everything's fine, don't touch me, okay? I don't need any help. And also the woman might complain that the bed feels hard. That's another very good thing. For some reason, lying on the bed, everything feels hard. It's all about you know the body being uncomfortable and not being where it should be. Now you can try giving it before a C-section if you have an ineffectual labor. So you can use Arnica for that situation as well. Or if the baby is lying crosswise. Now, often we think of pulsatilla if the baby is breached, so completely the other way. But if the baby is crosswise, you might want to think to Arnica first. Mm, interesting. I did not know that. And now also Arnica is indicated for a post vacuum extraction or a forceps delivery. Now that's not surprising at all because both of those are kind of like a physical injury, right? There was a squeezing. And so, uh, and so there could be uh, injury to the mother. There could be bruising. There could be, you know, the forceps pushed against the vaginal wall and there could be bleeding and it, there could be bruising inside. And also think to give it to the baby as well, especially with the baby, you know, with the head being compressed. Yeah. Yeah, and Arnica is so good for head injuries too, isn't it? Amazing. But if you have head injury with depression, we give them that self. Yes. That's, uh, staphysagria. Okay, so we were talking about uh, uh, catheterization. So this is going to be a very, very good remedy for that. So, but it's also indicated staphysagria is an amazing remedy for superficial incisions or lacerations. So if you cut yourself, um, very kind of superficially on your skin, uh, staphysagria might be indicated. So in this case, we're thinking about a C-section or the episiotomy. That's a more of a superficial laceration, not so much like when you're getting deeper into the uterus, we have another remedy for that. Often it's accompanied by cutting and very sharp pains. We call them lancinating. So it feels like, Zoop! can you imagine just like a, being cut like that? Ah, that stinging, cutting pain. That's what you're thinking about with staphysiagris. So there's a bit of a burning kind of associated with it, but not quite burning, more like a cutting. So it's great after this catheterization I was talking about if the urinary tract is painful. Mm -hmm. You can use Arnica if it feels bruised, or you can alternate with both. Remember, this is an acute situation for all you people out there who are not familiar with dosing and how often, and I was told to only use once and not to mix. This is an acute situation, okay? You deal with what's in front of you. If the person feels like it's sharp pains, give the, the, the staphysagria. And all of a sudden they're saying, you know, but it really feels kind of bruisey and kind of achy. Go to the Arnica. Don't be afraid to switch back and forth. It's absolutely fine. Now, a catheter is used 
both with the forceps and a C-section delivery and with an epidural to minimize risk of injury to the bladder because a full bladder is vulnerable to being damaged during delivery. So after a C-section, the catheter might be left in place for up to 48 hours. So it can leave the urethra feeling sore and sensitive, like a mild cystitis. So think to staphysagria. You know, I had a friend before I was a homeopath who had a prostate uh, operation, and he ended up having like a year, a year of urethritis and stinging pain. Uh -huh. And if I'd only known, I could have given him staphysagria. He might have needed cantharis, which is more more stinging than staphysagria. Yeah. Could have probably fixed it in like less than a, a week. You know? I know. Thank God we know homeopathy, Robin. A single dose after a C-section can also help prevent trapped gases. Now, any of you out there, raise your hand who had C-sections. I had two emergency ones. I could tell you after the second one, that trapped gas, oh my God, I wish I had known about staphysagria at the time. So that's a very good alternate usage of staphysagria. And there's also, what is that emotional concomitant? Well, there's, there's an excitability. There could be irritability, anger, anxiousness, and indignation is the big one with staphysagria. Yeah. Uh, I always remembered it because it sounds like stuff. They stuff it in. So staphysagria, they tend to stuff the emotions. And then when it comes out, it's like this big explosion. So certainly during uh, uh, birth, nobody's holding it in. It's just this big, like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe I needed a C-section. Oh my God. I, all these things always happen to me. Think to Staphysagria. Yeah. And it can even be a feeling of humiliation too with it, right? Oh, I was, you know, it's, yeah, wasn't what I planned. You know, what, yeah. Yeah. Like I did everything right. Right. Nobody ate, had more vitamins. Nobody. I did 10,000 steps a day. How dare you tell me I need a C-section of all the mothers in the universe. So here's Bella's Prentice. When remember we were talking about superficial versus deep cuts. Yeah. Indicated for deep internal incisions and lacerations and deep trauma. It can relieve deep bruised, achy soreness. So what did that remind you of? Arnica, but when we're getting really into deep, deep, deep long tissue, start to think to Bella's Paranus, and the uterus can feel as if it's being squeezed. The person often cannot stand or even walk. I mean, they're so sore, they're so uncomfortable that the pelvic, because the pelvic area has so much pain, and it almost feels as if the pubic bones are giving away. They have absolutely, there's this like weakness. They're often very uh, worse heat. So that's another way to tell if you might need uh, a staphysagra. You, I mean, Bell's Perennis, like it, they might be throwing off the blanket, right? They're worse heat, the warmth of the bed, or even a hot bath, right? So how do you know when I, I told you Bell's Perennis and both staphysagra are indicated for these lacerations or for cuts? So how do you know, aside from the superficiality or depth of the cut, one way to differentiate well, did you see me mention any mental emotional concomitants to Bellis Perennis? I did not, all right? So there aren't really any mental emotional markers that we can associate with Bellis Perennis. So if you have the anger and the indignation, you might wanna to go to the Staphysagria first, okay? Yeah. So you might see that like in a planned C-section, right? Like we were saying, I can't believe I needed a C-section. Yeah. All right. That's good. And it follows Arnica well. So these things really, you know, we're, we're, we look at associations and the remedies, we look at their, their relationships and whether they follow each other well or whether they're not indicated because there are some remedies that can actually antidote other remedies. So we have like thick books with all of these indications, but Arnica and Bellis Prentice are like bread and butter, you know, peanut butter and jam. Yeah. They go really, really well together. So yeah. don't be afraid to alternate. And they're similar, right? Because they're both daisies. Arnica is yep. the mountain daisy and Bellis perennis is the common daisy. That is such a great comment, Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> so you're going to see that they come from, if they come from a similar, um, I don't know if it's, there's certainly a kingdom, whether it's phylum and, you know, and, and further down, I don't know how closely, but when they're, when they are very similar remedies, uh, uh, plants, you're going to find that they're going to share a lot of the same uh, therapeutic values. All right, so let's look at Hypericum. I'm sure a lot of people out there know about Hypericum because what does it bring to mind? Nerves, right? Whenever yeah. like, you slam your finger in the door, 
think to hypericum. So what are you doing? You're cutting a lot of, you know, just even thinking about a pisiotomy, anybody out there just cross their legs unconsciously <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so think to hypericum. Yeah. Any nerve related injury, think to hypericum. It is also a very good antiseptic. Now, sometimes we'll use calendula. I don't know if people know that calendula is really great for healing um, wounds that have, you know, once the skin has come together and started granulation, then you can start with the calendula and it also has antiseptic qualities. Well, so does hypericum. And you can actually buy a lotion. I actually have it, which is a combination of hypericum and uh, calendula, which is one of my favorite go-tos whenever I have a cut. So you get double the antiseptic, you get the nerve quelling quality, and you also get the, um, the, um, all the great stuff that calendula does for healing a wound. Now it's indicated for pains in the sacrum. Sacrum is the lower, lower back and the coccyx. We know the coccyx, if you fall on the ground, your tailbone, right? After epidural or forceps delivery, you might also want to consider next vomica if it's not working. But the, in terms of, of an episiotomy, um, what you can do, what I'm now going into Miranda's book, just to give you some ideas of some therapeutic things to do, if an episiotomy is indicated. So you can prepare the area, it's called the perine perineum. During the last month of pregnancy, you can prepare it if you're trying to avoid having an episiotomy by massaging almond or olive oil onto it. And that's what she, she mentions those two oils, but I'm sure you can do coconut. I'm sure you can do any natural oil, unless there's some out there that might be toxic and I'm not aware of them. So I'm not gonna say a blanket, any oil, but the ones that are known to be safe, you can use. And you can also massage calendula oil into the perineum as the baby crowns, isn't that? That's why when a lot of people have these doulas, right? Because yeah. while they're there, they're putting the, the oil into the, on, onto the area. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? How do you take a ring off that's stuck? You put, try to put a little oil. Try to get a baby that's stuck, put a little <laughs> oil. <laughs> Another thing you can do, and which you, unfortunately in our, the way our hospitals are set up, you can't do this, but you know, we think about these women who go out into the field and give birth. Well, they're not lying on their backs in the field, right? They're, they're squatting, right? Because which way does gravity go? Does it go sideways? <laughs> <laughs> no, it helps. It helps you fall. Yeah. So you want to maintain an upright posture during labor, if you can, especially during the second stage. So if you can do some like supported standing or squatting or kneeling on all fours, that's an amazing way to kind of stretch things and to have things come down. Uh, it's kind of like using the squatty potty if you have one of those when you go to the bathroom and you put your legs up and, they, and so you're actually putting your body in a position where the rectum is, you know, and the whole lower uh, intestine is going in a way it, that is natural and towards gravity. So that might help towards preventing needing an episiotomy. And here's a great one from Miranda. She says, open your mouth wide as the baby comes out. Isn't that great? Wow. Just like you imagine your vagina opening, so um, open your mouth. She says there's an Im important link between your mouth and your vagina. And she said also make <laughs> raspberry sounds with your lips flapping as it helps the perineum to relax. So there's, <laughs> that's why this book is such a, such gold. Cause not only do you get all the homeopathy but you get these amazing tips. Um, and let's see what uh, it's characterized by very severe shooting pain. So shooting means like, whew, it feels like, like think of an arrow going off. So it feels like it's not localized and throbbing in one area. It's actually radiating out. And, uh, when you have tears, the episiotomy or the C-section scars. So that's a characteristic type of pain in homeopathy. When we look at the remedies qualities, we always try to understand deeper into, it's not enough. Oh, I have pain. What kind of pain? Okay, what is the nature of the pain? Does it radiate? Does it throb? Does it this? Does it that? So these, in this case, it's shooting pains. Now let's talk about colophyllum. This is another excellent remedy during childbirth. Now you would take 30C every two hours, up to six doses. This is for trying to induce labor without synthetic drugs. You don't want to take the oxytocin. You're overdue. You're ready to go. You can try taking colophyllum 30C every two hours for up to six doses. And then wait three days and repeat. If there's no labor at that point, your baby is not ready to be born yet. And Miranda very, very definitely says, don't try to push it. Let nature take its course. But you, you tried your best. And if it's still not ready, the baby is not coming out. The baby's not ready. 
here's a couple of other remedies, Cali Carbonicum, Hepar Self, and, uh, or Hepar Self, uh, Lachesis, and Silica. These are indicated for sore or lumpy scars that are uh, slow to heal. So this is after the baby is born and you still have some scars. Anytime you have slow to heal, you want to think about these remedies and silica is especially one of those. Uh, but you'd like to see also, not that you'd like to see abscesses and inflammation and pus, but if you are seeing those, hepar and silica are highly, highly indicated in slow to heal wounds that are also uh, inflamed and um, abscessing and giving out exudates of pus. Uh, and one way to differentiate between the two, although even though silica also does not, not like to be chilly, but hepar especially does not like to be exposed to cold air. Now, we talked about calendula. In this case, um, I don't know that I would necessarily take it internally through a pellet, but you can certainly use it topically. That actually was what calendula looks like. That is a calendula flower. You can use it in a lotion form, or you can use it as an oil, or you can use a diluted mother tincture. You can buy what's called a mother tincture, which is the uh, most, what we'll call material amount of the, of the substance. So you'll, you'll have the, the roots of the plant and they'll be cut off and they'll be chopped up and they'll be mixed with alcohol. And that's gonna be your mother tincture. And from that, it becomes serially diluted and then it becomes used sprayed on remedies. But you can buy mother tincture. I have the mother tincture of calendula and I like to mix it like in a, uh, like 10 drops or 20 drops in a quarter of a cup of water. And uh, then I can, um, you know, I can pour it onto a clean cloth or onto a uh, cotton uh, pad or something. And then I can actually put it onto the area that's been cut. In this case would be the episiotomy, for example, or for example, the, uh, the scar, uh, the, the pubic scar that you're gonna get from being cut open for the uh, C-section. Uh, it's very, very soothing, but always just make sure that the skin has come together and is starting to heal before you start using calendula. If you use it before, it can start to heal and bring things together before they're ready to. There's a whole process in wound repair where things have to happen with your eosinophils and your all your different, you know, your different macrophages. They all have to come in and do their job and clean the debris. And then when this when that's all done, the skin starts to come together. Your body's extremely brilliant. It knows exactly what to do when. Once you get that, you start seeing that, you know, coming together of the skin, then you can start using your calendula. Robin, then, did I ever tell you the story of the scalded uh, baby, the baby with the scalded head? Go ahead. Uh, it was an amazing story. It was just with the calendula tincture, just like you, you had suggested, you know, 10 to 30 drops, you know, in a quarter cup of water. Um, this mom had accidentally um, somehow scalded the baby's head with some tea felt so horrifically bad as a result. And the, the baby's head was quite angry. You know, it was about three months old, so pretty new still. And Calendula was just so amazing. She actually came back to show me like 24 hours later because she said it's just, it's a miracle. Calendula is so, so amazing for healing. It's it's remarkable. Remarkable. And it's amazing that you said that because now we're going to get into a, a remedy that will be for the mom because yeah. she's not the one who's injured, but she is going to be in such a panicky state. So we've got this lovely remedy. It's called Rescue Remedy, which I think a lot of you people know. Some people might take Rescue Night uh, to help them sleep. And I actually looked at the two sets of ingredients and there's only, they're exactly the same except for one. So if you only have Rescue Night available to you, absolutely, you can use it in this situation as well. So, uh, you know, if you're not allowed to take, you're not allowed to take anything by mouth before you have a, an anesthetic of any general anesthetic for sure, if you're gonna, so if you're about to have a C-section, so you can actually rub a few drops of the rescue remedy onto the forehead. I mean, it's good, you could take it by mouth as well, but you're really, you know, I mean, I think you could take a few drops. I don't think, you know, like, come on. I mean, they give you ice chips, you know, there, there's liquid in that too. But, you know, if the mother is not in a position to be responding to you while she's giving birth, then you can just uh, rub a few drops onto the forehead for anxiety and fear. And we, in, in Nicole's beautiful uh, story just now, a terrible story, but anyway, for the mother who was panicking that she had burned her child, this would have been probably extremely helpful as well. 
So let's just look before we move on to the next section. Let's look at some remedies for some uh, emotional states because giving birth is a highly uh, exciting for some people. It could be very anxiety inducing for some people. It could be very fearful for some people. So what are some of the remedies that uh, might be associated during the birth process? Well, there's lycopodium, which is very well known for anticipatory anxiety. And the thing about lycopodium is that they are very nervous ahead of time, but then once they're in the process of doing it, it's kind of like, oh, like this isn't so bad. Actually, this is pretty good. So think of that for a mom who's having this anticipatory anxiety and it's like, you know, it's getting better as things are going on, but, and also she, there might be associated with some, I don't know, you're going to be having so much pain from birth, but if there's some gaseous, there's some bloating, whatever, you might also want to think to like a podium as a very good match. And they could also be quite irritable. So that's a good thing to know. Argentum nitricum is for anxiety and also for a strong sense of failure. Remember we talked just at the beginning of my talk where, you know, the, the mother who feels like she's being told you have to have the C-section and she feels like, you know, I can't, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my body? I can't even give birth like billions of women before me. Well, you know, you can't tell her, well, you know, hundreds of millions of women have also had to have a, an emergency C-section. So you're just as normal as those people. But for that strong sense of failure, it's a very good one. Aconite, you know that one, that's our shock remedy. It's something that happens too fast. There's this great sudden fear, worries that she will die. That's the, the you know, I can't have a C-section. I'm gonna, I'm gonna die on the table. I'm never gonna make it through it. You know, that kind of is like, you wanna slap them, like they're getting hysterical. Aconite is a very, very good one. Pulsatilla is very, as we know, we've been through pulsatilla so many times. Uh, even though pulsatilla, yes, can be irritable, but more often than not, they tend to be very weepy and clingy and they would, don't leave me and I want need to hold your hand. And I, I can't believe I'm going through this. Like, do you love me? Do you love, tell me you love me. That's pulsatilla. Then chamomilla is extremely angry. And one thing about chamomilla, everything is more painful than it should be. So that the response to the pain, the reaction, every, you know, we've all, for all of us women who have been through labor, uh, it hurts, right? But for chamomilla, oh my God, oh my God, no one has suffered ever in the history of the world, the way that I am suffering now and throwing things and get out of here and how dare you knock me up and like, <laughs> sure, it's easy for you. Stop shoving ice in my face, you know? <laughs> That's chamomilla. Or give me ice, give me ice. And then they give you the ice. Who, this ice is too big. This ice is too small. <laughs> <laughs> Never satisfied. <laughs> Sound familiar out there? <laughs> I love your descriptions, Robin. Yeah, it's just so true. Yes, it's well described, all of them. And then there's the staph sangria, which we covered before. So there could be a little bit of anger or stuffing in or not expressing it. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, this big like, wah, belching of indignation and resentfulness. And then again, we talked rescue remedy. I just showed you the picture before. So there's a lot of anxiety and fear. So you can drink it, you can dip a sponge in it, you can suck on it, you can rub it on the forehead. So just, you know, I keep it on hand in case there's a little bit of anxiety. I think it's a really, it's a really good remedy. Now I saw one question. Are there any questions for me right now before we move on? Uh, no, no, no questions. There was just a question about uh, where the other webinars could be found. Yep. And so I typed in the answer, yeah, www.forhomeopathycanada.org um, slash webinars, right? So, yeah, so for anyone who wants to see the two previous webinars that Robin and I did together, yeah, just go to that uh, website. Yeah, all the lovely things about being pregnant, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an amazing, wondrous, unbelievable time but it's got its problems too. And uh, homeopathy is here to make life a little bit easier for you during those nine months. Absolutely, absolutely. Plus you're not gonna get everything, just, you know, have it on hand just in case. Have it on hand, make a make a kit up when you go, when, yeah. All right, so let's move on to the wonderful postpartum hemorrhage. Now, this is something you don't wanna see happening. Nobody wants to see blood coming out of their body. Uh, and so homeopathy, is amazing for postpartum hemorrhage. It occurs in about three to 5% of women. So even though it's not hugely prevalent, it does happen. 
Now, what is what do we consider different kinds of hemorrhage in terms of amounts? Like a minor loss of blood is less than a liter. A major one is greater than one liter and severe is greater than two liters of blood loss. So uh, you'll probably see the latter, that last one, when you have a kind of a situation where the blood is gushing out. Now, the risk of death is a one in 100,000 deliveries in high income countries. And in low income countries, it's as high as one in 1,000. Wow, that's frightening. Very, that's very, very frightening. Um, there are two kinds of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. One is called primary, and that happens within the first 24 hours of delivery. And then you have secondary, which is beyond 24 hours. So that's just a means of classification. Mm. All right, so we can see the blood that's in there. We see the placenta there on top, and we see the blood pooling over here. So let's see how we can fix this. So what are four of the main causes of postpartum hemorrhage? Okay, they're called the four Ts. The first one is called the lack of tone in the uterus, right? What is tone? Well, you know, when our body is toned up. So it means that the muscles are able to contract and they're able to do what they're supposed to do. So this is the most common cause of true postpartum part of hemorrhage, and it happens in about 70% of cases. Now, normally after giving birth, the uterus contracts, right? It's a muscle and it retracts to a normal size slowly. Obviously not for a while. We've all seen pictures of women coming out and it looks like they still have the baby in them, but that's just because there's still, you know, there's contractions going on and it takes some time for the uterus to come back to its normal smaller size. Okay. But what if that tone, that muscle tone isn't very good? What if the contractions are imperfect or there's retraction, even pushing back of the uterine muscle? It can cause continuous bleeding. You need that contraction for the blood to bring itself back into the body, okay? The muscles just don't have the strength to stop the bleeding. Now, it could be Lots of reasons for that. It could be that the mother is older, for example, or it could be that she's had a lot of children previously and that muscle tone, you know, it, you know, you get kind of flabby if you don't, I mean, you can go to the gym and work out your uterus, you know? So if you have a lot of children, <laughs> I just had an image of a uterus in the gym. But then, uh, it, it could be that the uterus is distended, right? It's, it's pushed out due to multiple babies, or there could have been a very big baby that, you know, just pressed against the muscles and basically flattened and ironed it out. And now the tone isn't there. There could be anemia and malnutrition. So there's some physical reasons for it, uh, nourishment reasons, or it could just be to a pr prolonged labor that just like plum tuckered out all the muscles in there. Now, another cause is a retained placenta. So there, that means that bits of the, so the placenta is attached to the wall, the uterine wall, and as it's pulled out for the baby to be born, little bits of placenta are not expelled. It's supposed to all come out. You know, they deliver the placenta after they deliver the child. And that happens in about 10% of all cases. And you can imagine the placenta is up against, you know, and it pulls off, it can actually cause a bit of a wound or like a, a sore area, and, and then the blood vessels become exposed. There could be trauma, so there could be lacerations, right, to the genital, genital tract, to either the cervix or the vagina, to the perineum, and also rarely there can be a uterine rupture, and that's more at risk for women who have had previous C-sections, and then they try what's called a VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after a cesarean, and they try it, and the stitches don't hold, and so that's the situation where you might have a lot of bleeding, and that happens in 20 percent of all cases. And then finally, in the least uh, common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is a coagulation disorder, in which case there's clotting and it's not allowing for the, uh, the blood just keeps going on and on. And that happens in less than 1% of all cases. So what are some of the remedies that we can give to a woman who is bleeding? But the real question we have to ask is, are the medical staff you know, if we're not doing this with a midwife in a private situation, are they going to even let us administer our homeopathy to the patient? So although medical intervention will likely be given at the first sign of abnormal bleeding, homeopathic treatment can actually work very, very fast. This is a very acute situation and homeopathic remedies in acute situations act acutely. They can act in mere seconds, okay, because it's a sudden onset. Therefore, there is a quick response to the homeopathic remedy, usually within five to 30 seconds. So you can ask the medical staff if they could hold off just for 30 seconds to administer the homeopathic remedy because it will act quickly and they can step in. If it doesn't work, you say, look, if it doesn't work, 
I'm giving, you know, give me 30 seconds to a minute. If it doesn't work, do your stuff. But let's see if we can do this without any kind of a, you know, cutting, cauterization, whatever it is that they're doing to stop the bleeding. So the first remedy I want to talk about is phosphorus, and you want to give it in a 200 C. So you'll see with Miranda, she's recommending 30 C in a lot of her book, but we're talking about a big acute situation here. You want to go up in the potency because you're having a very dynamic situation. And as long as the mother has not fainted, in which case her vitality has dropped and you want to go a bit lower because you don't want to overwhelm her. If she's, you know, she's out there and she's fine and you want to give 200 C, you want to up your potency a little bit. So what are we looking for in order to differentiate among all our remedies that are associated for hemorrhage? There's a whole bunch of different aspects to the blood that we're going to look for. And one of those things is the color of it. Okay. In this case, phosphorus is associated with a lot of bright red blood. If anybody out there has ever been given phosphorus because they have a tendency towards nosebleed or epistaxis, as we call it, and it tends to be of a bright red color, or if their menzies have, they have issues with their menzies and it's a bright red color, Phosphorus is indicated for all of those situations, as it is here. Now, another a variable about the blood is the pace of the blood. Is it coming out fast? Is, is it coming out slow? Is it oozing out? Oozing. We have a, a remedy for that called ustalago, oozing. Uh, for oozing, or is it gushing out, or is it coming out in clots, or is it in dribs and drabs? Is it, it, what is the amount of it? Is it scanty, or is it profuse? These are all of the things we look at to try to determine the right remedy. So in this case, there's copious gushing blood, so there's no mistaking it. Bright red, like scary, scary, like from a, from a horror movie kind of blood. There might be that history of nosebleed, uh, not that you're going to have time to ask while the mother's on the table <laughs> and a history of profuse menzies, but something to keep in mind, because if you're taking care of somebody or if you're aware of somebody who's giving birth, you these are the type of, that's why we, we can't just come in and just be there during the birth. We like to take a whole history ahead of time. So we're alerted. Oh, this is her history with bleeding. So this is likely if she starts to bleed, this is what, what she might need if it comes out of her the way all the other blood has come out of her throughout her life. There might be a thirst for icy cold water. That's a very high indication for phosphorus. And then if it doesn't work, you want to go straight to Ipecac, okay? 200 C. That's just a little tip for you to know. So once we're talking about Ipecac, let's talk about it here, or Ipecacuana, as it's called, also 200 C. In this case, the blood could be bright red or dark, okay? And there is a flow of profuse, steady blood. Now, remember with the uh, phosphorus, it was gushing. In this case, it's just like a nice, continuous, steady stream. So that's how you differentiate. Now, the most important thing about Ipecacuana is the fact that it is useful in nausea. We all know this. Ipecac is used for, for nausea, right? So this is what's called a characteristic symptom. This is how we differentiate among remedies. If you have somebody who is bleeding and it is coming out, so dark or red doesn't matter, but there is that nausea. That nausea overrides so many other things because it is unusual. It is not common to feel nausea while you're having a hemorrhagic experience. But if you are, you go straight to that Ipecac. That is your characterizing, unusual, characteristic symptom that you wanna pay attention to. There can be that gushing of blood with each retch. So that person will be, uh, uh, there's that nausea. And then the gushing of the blood comes with each one. And the blood can feel hot. So that's another characteristic of the, of the blood that we want to take uh, notice of. The color, the pace which it comes out, whether we're going to talk about uh, clotting, coagulation. And then the temperature of it is another way to differentiate among remedies. Now, what does a person look like who's exceedingly nauseous? right? They tend to look like a ghost, right? They, their face could be very pale. They could almost appear deathly. So you have the combination of the nausea and the deathly appearance. Think of an Ipecac. We had Arnica before. We're going to have it again. This is when the etiology, we always want to look at the etiology. In this case, there was an injury possibly. Maybe the baby was too big, or maybe they used a forcep delivery, that there's a bit of, you know, that there was, uh, there's an injury from the instruments that were used to bring the baby out. In this case, the blood can be clotted, 
right? So that's what it looks like. It's oozing, okay? In this case, it's not gushing, it's not spurting, it's just coming out in a steady kind of oozing passive stream. Again, the person might feel as if they're bruised. The, they could, could be complaining that the bed feels hard. And you know, this is one of our classic symptoms, but it's amazing. It's amazing whenever a patient comes out with a symptom that is just so classic for the remedy and it fits it so perfectly, you'll see, they'll say, I'm so uncomfortable. I just, I can't get a good position on the bed. Beautiful for Arnica. And also don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. Remember that? Denies anything is wrong. Doesn't want to be touched. That's Arnica. Belladonna, can't think of blood without thinking of Belladonna, another beautiful remedy for hemorrhage, 200C again. In this case, when we think of Belladonna and we think of those, you know how the eyes, you know, so the atropine, so it's, it, that's what Belladonna is, and it's used when the eye, uh, eyes are dilated. So a good way to remember when a Belladonna, how Belladonna is needed is just like the dark color of the eyes when it's, when it's dilated, it's dark red blood with lots of dark clots. So think of the dark clot, like the dilated eye, and you'll think of Belladonna. In this case, there's sudden gushes of profuse blood. So sometimes there could be little gushes, little spurts. In this case, it's profuse, very, very frightening. The blood is warm or hot, and it can have an offensive odor. So that's a good way to differentiate in this case. Okay, I'm done with the hemorrhage section. We I, interesting, I'm, interesting. I'm not, in, we, I'm not inspiring any questions. Well, actually, we had a, a question um, previously about one of your previous slides about the rescue remedy. If you yeah. could just talk a little bit more about how the rescue remedy is different from a homeopathic remedy and whether it's made up of a single remedy or a combination. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'm just gonna disappear for a split second and I'll be right back. <laughs> My pleasure. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, it is a bit controversial for me to be putting in rescue remedy into a talk on homeopathy because uh, one, it is um, composed of uh, four different remedy for different substances um, and four or five uh, so that we call that polypharmacy. In homeopathy, we like to only give one remedy at a time. Secondly, it is composed of substances that have not been determined, what we call approving. So we haven't determined what they really do in a in a classic homeopathic proving. So we haven't given it to a healthy person and then waited and see what kind of symptoms came up. I, I, I think there's some, you know, he went into a field and, you know, he had these revelations. I don't know. It's, it's not done in the, in the exact same way. It is prepared homeopathically in that they're often 5X, 6X, 30C. So they're prepared in a homeopathic fashion. But by the fact that there's multiple remedies in one treatment and the fact that they haven't been proven in the classic way, both of those preclude them from being called classical homeopathic treatment. That being said, they work. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about it. They're not homeopathy in the classical way, but they work. So if they work for you, I mean, the problem with it is if you have a reaction to it, if it elicits something in you and we want to antidote it, we have no way of knowing how to antidote it because we don't know which component inside of it, you know, but it's so gentle. The chance of it hurting you in any kind of way is very, very, very minimal. Yeah, the other thing I like about the rescue remedy specifically is it's kind of like an adjunct to homeopathy. You can add it, you can repeat it quite frequently, even more frequently than maybe you might want to use aconite. You know, it's like it can be used for panic, just like aconite. But um, maybe if, if aconite is not quite needed, you know, before it gets to the aconite state where you're in a complete panic, can try the rescue remedy first and repeat it frequently. Um, I yeah, I find it can be quite helpful that way as well. And it's good for animals too. You know, yeah, time of year with lots of fireworks for different things, and animals can get very scared. I know they have this new uh, heavy wrap that the, the blanket, like you know, that they can put on animals. That's very good. But that and this can be very, very, very. Uh, you know, it it just it just cuts the edge. What can I tell you? For a lot of people, it just so. In this case, it's what we call palliative. 
right? It's yeah. not to cure you. So that's another thing about the, it's called, you know, it's a, it's a rescue remedy. It's not meant to get to the root of your problem. Yeah. But in a pinch, in an acute situation, if you're feeling nervous about something, it can be very, very helpful. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, I think that was fabulous. Okay. If I didn't answer your question, please write to Nicole and we'll, we'll go deeper yeah. into it. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. All right. Oh, and I forgot, uh, I forgot there was one more Scott. Shooting pains that come and go. That's, that's, that's Belladonna. Okay. Now we're going to go on to the retained placenta. So that's when the placenta does not get expelled in the way that it needs to, right? It, after you give birth to the baby, you wait a little bit, clean the baby, and you just wait, wait for the contractions to start up again, and the placenta is expelled, and that's usually within 30 minutes of delivery. And uh, a retained placenta occurs in only 2% of all cases, but you know, it is, a, it can be an emergency situation because you don't want to have any sepsis. You don't want to have, you don't want to leave anything inside your body that shouldn't be there. So, oh, there you go. Must get the placenta out in a reasonable time as it can go septic. Okay. So in terms of potency, you want to start again, this is a acute dire, more of a dire situation. So you want to start with 200 C. You can put some in four ounces of water, stir two times, and you can give one teaspoon. And, uh, uh, you know, so while you're lying on the table and waiting for the placenta to start to come out, this can be repeated uh, every 30 minutes, which uh, this is what Miranda says. But I think in this situation, you want to repeat it more frequently uh, because, um, you know, you just want to get things moving along. It says 15 if, if nothing is happening, but I, I would do it more frequently. It really just depends on the state of the mom. Like we talked about before, if there's a, you know, she's doing fine, she's, the birth went well, she's still got her strength, you can repeat more frequently. But if she's just lying there like a, you know, like a wet sack of potatoes, you know, be careful about the repet repetitions because there's only so much her, what we call her vital force. So her, her energy within her that she can handle. So you don't want to hit it too often. Yeah, and last time you and I talked about uh, putting the remedy in water as well, just to uh, be able to repeat it a little more often, yet change the potency by either shaking it or stirring it. And that can often uh, help if somebody's vital force is quite low as well, wouldn't you say, Robin? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, it also mitigates any aggravations or any, you know, right? So the, the body will respond more strongly to just the pellet. But if you dilute it in water, it will be much more gentle. And also yeah. try to take it underneath the tongue. So it's touching as many nerve endings as quickly as possible. You want it because you once it goes in the stomach, I mean, you'll, you'll get a benefit, but whenever I take my own remedies, I always leave it under the tongue for a good 10, 15 seconds, just so that it touches as many nerve endings as possible. So we talked about cantharis before, if you remember, I had mentioned it peripherally, peripherally in terms of staphysagria, and if you have like a urethritis after catheterization. So uh, cantharis is very, very well known for that, for all kinds of issues in the uh, urinary, but it is also known for retained, it's also indicated uh, for retained placenta. And it's actually the first one to think of in retained placenta. Those. That was a big surprise, right, when I, when I uh, read that. It will help uh, it will help stop uterine contractions to resume. So I don't always think of it in terms of like a, kind of like a muscle kind of uh, remedy, but lo and behold, it is. And the very famous sensation of cantharis is burning. So especially if you're having retained placenta that's accompanied by a sense of burning in the pelvis in the back, then you know 100% that you want to go straight to cantharis. You use that burning as a confirmatory that this is the correct remedy. This is, uh, our, uh, unbelievably, it took this long for us to get to sepia because it is such a big remedy for women uh, all around menzies and labor and all kinds of stuff like that. So when you have these ineffective contractions and you're unable to expel the placenta, sepia mm -hmm. is in fact indicated. In the woman, what is that characteristic symptom? She will have a sense of bearing down. It almost feels like her organs are prolapsing or coming out of, down and out of her body. And it will be accompanied by sharp shooting pains in the cervix. That's a beautiful indication for sepia. The mom will feel very weary and overburdened and like, let's get this over with. And her hands might feel 
cold and clammy while the rest of the body is warm. So all of these things paint a very, you don't have to have all of these, but if you have some of these, it's a good indication for you that sepia might be indicated. Now, another remedy that we haven't mentioned, and I, I will bring it up a bit later, is sakale, which is I think a smut, right? Uh, and it's indicated also for that bearing down sensation and muscles will feel weak and exhausted. So just for you guys to know, because whenever we think of bearing down prolapse, whatever we think of sepia, but there are other remedies that are indicated. Now, another one we talked a bit a little bit before is colophyllum again. In this case, there's more like a partial separation of the placenta. Hmm. And it can help establish effective contractions. Now, the retained placenta, what is the cause of it? It could be due to weakness and complete exhaustion. Colophyllum is a wonderful remedy during labor when the mother is kind of almost passed out. Like she's so tired, I can't do this anymore. So there's that great sense of prostration and weakness. You want to think to colophyllum. So in the situation of a retained placenta, there is also that feeling of weakness and exhaustion. The mom just wants to sleep. That's a really good way of knowing that colophyllum might be indicated. Now, think of, um, I want you, to, the remedy I'm gonna give you now, I want you to think of, remember I talked about a characteristic symptom. So remember when I talked about nausea, when you have nausea as a really, really, really strong presenting acute symptom in anything you want to think to Ipecac, right? So that's our represents our, our really characteristic symptom. So I'm going to give you a bunch of remedies now and their characteristic symptom that will help you think to them during uh, retained placenta. Great. In this case, we're going to go to Simisifuga. Uh, in this case, there's exhaustion, trembling, and shaking or shivering. So that's a really, really you know, that's an easy one to see. You can't miss it. Think of Simisifuga if you see that shivering. Yeah. For Pulsatilla, what is it going to be? What's the common thing? <laughs> weeping. <laughs> the weeping. So you're going to have changeability, change. maybe. Changeability. One minute things are going one way, and another minute things are going another way. That is Pulsatilla, and she's going to be quite weepy. And Ipecac, what is it going to be? There's going to be the nausea that accompanies the retained placenta. You might also think to nux vomica in a 30C or sulfur if the mom was given pitocin or oxytocin to help move the labor along and the placenta is not separating from the uterus. So in those situations where something was given to induce more contractions, you might want to think to nux vomica or sulfur. And nux vomica will often be accompanied by a lot of irritability. Yeah, great. All right, we're on to the next section. We're good to go? Yeah. All right. Yeah, no other questions. The, the other thing that I just wanted to mention about Nux Vomica is I often find it complementary to Pulsatilla. Um, sometimes a, a woman can be in a Pulsatilla state and then all of a sudden switch or the other way around. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Situation, right? Do you yeah. find that too? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, that, and that's such an interesting piece uh, information to share because Pulsatilla can have a lot of irritability. That's why people can often be confused whether to get, well, I can't give, she's not crying. She's actually quite irritable. And this is that, that else actually can be Pulsatilla. So that's great when the person thinks, it looks like they need the Pulsatilla and they go, they're changing their mood from, irritable, from, from weepy to irritable and it doesn't work. Then you yeah. can think to the next vomica. So that's yeah. really, yeah. really interesting. Great. All right. So postnatal, we're in the second part of my talk. I have two areas here. Um, these are uh, conditions that happen to the mom after giving birth, and they can be found in chapter four, as well as chapter five in the, both the birth and the postnatal period. All right. So uh, just to show you, I'm going to be doing lochia and prolapse and breastfeeding issues right now. All right. Great. All right. So let's look at lochia. Lovely lochia. What is lochia? Lochia is the normal discharge from the uterus after giving birth. And it contains the last of the amniotic fluid, the sloughed off tissue, the mucus and the blood. So you have a whole factory going on inside of you. I mean, this whole, this whole birth thing, like, come on. I mean, this thing is, who invented this? Who came, who's the engineer who came up with the brilliant, oh my God, like, you mean we can reproduce? <laughs> we don't have to use a printer? <laughs> like, wow. 
<laughs> so there's <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff going. Have you ever been to a to a construction site? Do you think there isn't like a crap load of stuff that is there when you're finished that you have to clean up? There's no different when you're giving birth. All right. Yeah. So as the placenta separates from the uterine wall after delivery, the last of the amniotic fluid drains away and there is some blood loss and it can leave a raw kind of a wounded area that takes up to about six weeks to heal. Now it's very normal, it's absolutely fine. So lochia is this normal discharge from the uterus after childbirth, but the amount needs to be monitored. You can see this picture here with the pads. You wanna be monitoring it, okay? That's the great thing about the pads. It actually can give you evidence of what's going on because if you have too much of the lochia and there's a lot of blood in it, it can lead to anemia. Or if there are clots or an unpleasant smell in the discharge, it could indicate a uterine infection or some remaining fragments of the placenta. And what do we know about homeopathy? We want to individualize it even down to the smell and the nature of the smell, what it smells like can help us differentiate remedies. So it's an extremely important piece of information for the new mom to share. Okay, the amount and the duration of the lochia are not different whether you've had natural childbirth or a C-section, isn't that interesting? So even if you've not had that trauma through the vaginal canal, the amount is the same because it's all the stuff that's coming from inside the uterus. Now, lochia will start off bright red at the beginning, and after a few days, it becomes kind of reddish brown. So it's kind of mimicking a menstrual cycle for a lot of people, which starts off uh, uh, brighter and then gets darker as it goes towards the end of the week. And then it could be even brown before it peters out. Now, some red later on is normal as well, so don't worry about that. Now, it can last anywhere from two to six weeks, and if you don't breastfeed, it will usually stop after your first period. Now, what are some abnormal symptoms? Well, there could be heavy bleeding, there could be clots, there could be that foul odor of the discharge. And if it doesn't diminish over time, you're gonna to wanna to see it waning over time. Otherwise, if it just keeps coming out of you, coming out of you, something is not, 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 something is not right. So that's lochia and we'll get to some remedies. And then what is prolapse? And that results when the pelvic muscles or the ligaments are damaged or weakened and they cannot hold the organs in place. Now, it can occur due to a difficult childbirth or by having had multiple births. So everything's kind of loosey-goosey inside of there, right? The uterus can fall down into the vagina. It could push against the rectum and the bladder can even come out. There can be a, uh, a dragging feeling, a sensation of dragging down in the pelvis as if everything would fall out. And so it's very, very important. This is why they say you do these Kegel exercises to do these pelvic floor exercises throughout the pregnancy and afterwards as well. It's like anything else. If you want to be in good shape and good tone, you have to work the muscles as much as you can. So, so much for that uterus going to the gym, you can actually just work the floor, uh, the pelvic floor muscles and you can help develop and maintain good tone. Yeah, pelvic floor and core muscles are so important for women as we get older. I think we just do so much sitting and it's just so, so, so important. Right, yeah. and you see all these commercials for Depends and, you know, uh, let's, yeah. let's treat it by simply, you know, just making sure your pants stay dry. Well, how about like curing it? How about fixing exactly. it? Exactly. So yeah. That's where yeah. we come in. So it can affect not just the uterus but and the vagina, but the bladder and the rectum as well. All of these are capable of uh, either a sensation of prolapse or actual prolapse. All right, so what are the oh, some of the remedies? The first one I'm going to think of is Arnica. It helps the uterus to contract and it helps heal the wounded area where the placenta was attached. So always think of it in terms of injury, okay? Another remedy is called creosodium. That's a very interesting one. It's carbon-based. In this case, remember we talked about an odor? This is a foul smelling lochia with black clots. Now, boy, talk about, yeah, boing, 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 notice me, notice me, that foul smelling and the black clots that you think to creosodium. And also if that weren't enough, there's a sensation associated with the lochia coming out of it. There's actually a pain. And in this case, the nature of that pain is excoriating, burning, blistering discharge. And it can affect the surrounding tissue. So you could see lots of redness and eating away of the tissue around the area. God, that is so uncomfortable. Oh my God, if creosotum works, if you have a situation like this, you have a patient for life, you have like flowers on your desk, you've got, my God, how painful is that situation? Poor woman having needing creosotum. 
And also there's, when we look at the pace of it, right? we talked about whether it oozes or stops and starts. In this case, the Lokia starts and then it stops. And then when it restarts, it's even as if, as if everything else wasn't bad enough and you thought it's finally getting better. When it comes back, it's even more profuse the second time around. Like this is a dire, miserable situation. Mm-hmm. is a beautiful remedy for this situation. And then we have the lovely Lilium tigrinum. Is that the most gorgeous flower? It really is. Yes, the tiger lily. Ah, gorgeous. So in this case, we also have dark, foul-smelling, excoriating lochia. So how do we know which one to choose? We differentiate. In this case, this is the characteristic symptom. The discharge only occurs when moving about. Isn't that interesting? But when they're at rest, it doesn't come out. So that's a great way to differentiate between the two remedies. Mm -hmm. And there can also be that bearing down sensation like you have in sepia, like you have in Sakali, for example. Pulsatilla is another very good remedy. You're starting to see there's, there's a pattern. Every time we're giving these classes, it's the same remedies because all of these remedies are associated with this time of life, this time, this Mm -hmm. event in life. Okay. In this case, the lochia is scanty. So you don't get a lot of it and it's hardly red at all. In fact, it's quite milky in color. It returns having almost stopped. So that was similar with the creosote, uh, but there's no indication here that it comes back even more profusely. But there's that changeability that we see in pulsatilla. It stopped, we're done, and then it changes and it's coming back again. The woman can feel faint with each flow. So that's a very good way to differentiate. And again, there could be that weepiness, clinginess, timidness, that kind of feeling. Yeah. And then we have silica, which we had seen before. We, we talked about silica in terms of having an abscess, right, uh, after being cut into, uh, slow to heal, but it's also indicated for lochia. And in this case, this is such a great symptom. It flows while the baby breastfeeds, and then at other times it doesn't. So that is a great way to know that you need silica. That's why we're talking about these really characteristic symptoms. We're always, the more characteristic symptom that you can find and that you ma- that, ma- that matches your patient or your symptom, then you can have higher and higher uh, trust that this is the right remedy. And then we have chamomilla again. In this case, the lochia is profuse, dark, and clotted. A bit like the woman's anger, it's dark, <laughs> it's profuse, <laughs> it's <laughs> plotted with probably cuss words and <laughs> all sorts of things. That's a great way to remember it. So the angry, the pain is too much. Remember with chamomile, always yeah. the, the, the sensation of the pain, the way the person experiences the pain is always higher than what is actually happening in the body. Very intense emotions, hey, in chamomile. Very, very intense emotions. It's very, yeah. yeah. But there are other remedies, especially if you're having kids out there and, the, and, they're, and they're very, you know, they're throwing tantrums and they're this, and you always want to go to chamomilla, but you also have to think of a remedy like Sina, oh. which is also yeah. indicated for children with a temper tantrums. So don't get, lo- even though I'm giving you these characteristic, sim- characteristic mm-hmm. symptoms, don't get locked into one remedy. Yeah. You have other remedies. So you always have to get a totality, a whole picture of what's going on with the person. And then you can have greater confidence with which one to give. Yeah, it's a good reminder. Okay. So we've talked a bit about prolapse before, before about that sensation or, or actual occurrence of, of something leaving the body, being bearing down within the body. Uh, and we're not moving, there we go. So there's that bearing down sensation. That's a keynote of, of sepia, as if everything will fall out. Yeah. I don't know why. Oh, did this, this might have died on me. <laughs> uh, the prolapse is accompanied by constipation. Oh, there we go. Uh, often it can, uh, the etiology can be that there could be multiple births that are close together. And the person will often feel better sitting with the legs crossed or even standing with the legs crossed. It's as if they can keep the organ from falling out if they keep their legs crossed. So, you know, somebody sitting across from you and you, uh, you, so you always, when you're observing a patient, you want to observe everything about their body position as well. 
and the emotion that can come with it, there could be a sadness, there could be, so there could be a lot of tears, there could be anger, uh, you'll, you can see, you can see some indifference, and a very classic feeling for sepia is one of resentfulness, and especially after having given birth, right, this could be the career woman, this could be uh, the person who wants to get back to their old size, or to their old job, or to whatever, and they're, you know, not only have they given up their body and not only have they given up nine months of their life to producing this child, uh, but now, even though it's, the child is out of them, they're still having difficulties. And like, it's enough already. I, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, I, I've had enough. That is sepia. Especially with the multiple births together, you can just imagine the sort of... Right. Right. And if that was planned, right. If it wasn't planned, it was probably somebody who was breastfeeding and didn't think she could get pregnant again yeah. and gives birth with 11 months later. And like, yeah. are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Pulse I know somebody like that too. I don't know if she was a CP at the time because I was too young, but I had a friend who was breastfeeding. The first one was, was unplanned. <laughs> And then the second one was while she was breastfeeding. Yep, 11 months later, it's just, uh, yep, yep, quite Junior. a shock. So, in this case, with the, the prolapse, there can be a concomitant. So, sometimes for any condition, if you have something that occurs at the same time. So, when we talked about any of the other things like the hemorrhage accompanied by nausea, that's in a concomitant, those are gold. So in this case, if you have a concomitant of a sensation of pressure in the abdomen and the small of the back, you wanna to think to pulsatilla. Again, they can be weepy or clingy or irritable. And another big uh, keynote of uh, uh, pulsatella, which I haven't mentioned yet tonight, is they have a tendency to like an open air, right? They wanna have the window open. They wanna have a bit of a breeze. They find the heat of a warm room to be oppressive. Here's one we haven't talked about, and this is such a cool one. And if we think about it, we think we anybody out there who's used Rust talks, we think of it more as something that you use when you you know your ligaments are hurting, right? Like you know, getting out of the chair hurts, and then when I start walking, it starts to feel better. And if I've been out in the cold uh, and the rain, just like a rusty fence, you know, uh, everything hurts and everything gets stuck like a fence. But then if I come inside and I warm up and I get into a hot bath, everything feels better. So yeah. why would rust talks be indicated for prolapse? Well, there could be due to overexertion. That was the uh, origin of it. So you have been moving around those ligaments too much or the ligaments are strained from excessive pushing in the second stage of labor. So there's a perfect reason, right? Because you you have to open up these ligaments when you're giving birth. Yeah. Now, as I said, a rest talks is better for warmth, air, bath, or wrapping up. They're better for changing positions. So that classic, I feel stiff when I get out of bed or if I get out of my chair, but as soon as I start walking, I start feeling better. And they are worse from the cold and from the damp. And then we have our last remedy for prolapse. We have Calcarea florica. And this is useful for any tissues. So we often see a lot of mineral remedies for these muscle and bone and ligament kind of areas. So in this one, it's useful for any tissues that have become worn out, flabby and lax. So very, very good for women who have had multiple, multiple births and certainly close to each other when there hasn't been an opportunity for everything to get toned up again. Mm. And then uh, one reason to give it is that you have no other confirmatory symptoms. There's nothing there to, there's no emotional stuff. There's no physical commonness. There's nothing. So you might want to just go to calc floor. And I know what you're thinking, Nicole. Yes. Yes, you can give it in a tissue salt. <laughs> I was going to ask you that. I, I knew you were. <laughs> so tissue salts are similar to the actual remedy, but they're very, they're closer to the mother tincture. They're closer to the material substance there. You often want to give it in a 6X. Here we're giving stuff in 30 and 200 C. So 6X is just diluted 10 times versus in the 100 times each time with the C um, potentization. And you can take it simultaneously with another remedy as well. So you can take some of the other remedies and then you can give calc floor, take calc floor simultaneously as a tissue salt. Okay, and as we talked about before, Sakali is also good for prolapse because it does also have that sensation of, of uh, prolapse or the sensation of things falling out of you. So during, but from a forceps delivery, you might want to think exclusively to Sakali. Great, right. great. 
And again, my thing isn't working. There we go. So we're on to the last section. We're in the la in the home uh, run. I don't know if anybody's left. I hope not. But uh, we're, <laughs> we're in a really, really good section right now, which is yeah. breastfeeding issues, which is a really, really pertinent uh, topic. Okay. My thing is losing juice, I think. So what are the issues that we're going to cover here? We're going to cover milk flow. And milk flow can have an issue if there's too little. Obviously, that's the one that everybody worries about if they don't have enough milk. But if you can believe it, having too much is also can be an issue and homeopathy can help with that. And then we're gonna deal with, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give up my thing because it is dying on me. And then we can, we're gonna deal with mastitis, which is a huge issue, right? Around block ducts yeah. and abscesses. And then we're gonna talk about sore and crack nipples because you've got sore nipples, you are not going to be enjoying uh, the breastfeeding and your baby's not going to be enjoying it either. All right. And it's a common problem. It's a huge problem and it's a yeah. common problem and homeopathy yeah. can really help, right? There's, and there's lots of natural things. You can put things as well for the cracked skin as well. So you can start with a 30C. It's more of a physical issue. You want to start a bit lower. Uh, and But what you want to do is you want to make it wet. You want to put it into water because you're going to want to take this frequently. So whenever you're taking remedies frequently, we prefer if you put it in water and then you, you, know, you mix it or you hit it against your hand. So every time you're taking a slightly stronger iteration of the remedy, you're not repeating the exact same uh, dosage. Okay, and you're going to want to take it three to four times a day for at least a few days before moving up in potency if it's even needed. If you're getting good results at 30C, stay there. If you find you've plateaued and you kind of want to go to the next level, you can go up to a 200C. Now, there's other things that you can be doing along, you know, breastfeeding issues are not just the, the breast issue itself. You want to be doing things outside of taking homeopathy in order to try to get things resolved. For example, bonding. Uh, I know with my kid, I, with my first child uh, who had an ineffective suck, uh, we got, went into bed for the entire weekend and we just lie down together and we watched TV and I read to him, you know, and sang to him and he suckled when he could and so you want to you want to promote that bonding and you need to learn how to do a proper latch so uh you know i think we've all had our boobs grabbed in the hospital by, by nurses and whatever but really if you, you're not doing the latch properly don't you know if it takes you 50 times to learn how to do it prop don't be embarrassed it's not a natural easy thing to do if you don't have a child who's capable of latching i my second one i mean i could have been four feet away and he would have latched onto me but the first one, it didn't matter what I did, he wouldn't latch on to me. So don't be embarrassed. It's not a failure. Just the more calm you are, the smoother things will run. Sure I think you're... so often we think that latching is just, it's natural. Breastfeeding is so natural. You know, it's just like you stick the baby on and it'll just work out. But that's not how it works. There is a technique. You both have to learn it, especially with your first baby. So yeah, it's very, very important how you mention it, Robin. Yeah. And then, and when you're doing it right, you know it. When you see the, the shape of the baby's mouth, you know, you know that you're doing it right. And then you've learned, it, you've learned it. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you're eating properly. So remember, your baby is drinking your milk and therefore your baby is drinking what you're eating as well, right? All the nutrition that's going into you. So you have to make sure that you're eating foods that are not causing the baby to have gas or colic or that are disagreeing with them. Uh, spicy foods can be a problem. So you have to be eating properly as well. And you also have to be feeding regularly. And the, there's that unfortunate tendency when it's not going well to space it out further and further. But in fact, in order to get your milk supply going, properly, the more you uh, have feeding or the more you express milk, uh, the more milk you will produce. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those cases of use it or lose it. Okay, so let's talk about milk flow. And obviously, in this case, this woman has had no difficulty whatsoever. But it, we'll talk about scanty first, because that's uh, the one that we are going to probably be treating far more often. So, what, let's talk about Urtica arens, which is a nettle plant, okay? In this case, there's no letdown, despite a feeling a tingle and a milk dripping from the nipple. So what is letdown, okay? That is the fat-rich hind milk that is released and that it's, it's, deliver, it's, it's released by oxytocin is what gives you that uh, hind milk. And that comes about three minutes after be, the baby begins to breastfeed, okay? So that's what the differentiated from four milk. That is the milk that comes in those first three minutes. It's very watery, bluish tinge sometimes. It comes out very naturally and very quickly and it's very thirst quenching, but it's low in fat. 
Okay. That's why it's so important to breastfeed for more than three minutes because only then will the oxytocin kick in and that hind milk start coming out. Okay. Because the hind milk is what's essential for the healthy growth of your baby. Okay. It's three times richer than four milk and it will spurt out. So whereas the four milk needs to be sucked out by the baby. And in fact, it is the brilliant engineering again, that sucking on the breast is what stimulates the hormones to release oxytocin. Okay. That's why you need the four milk, not only to quench the baby's thirst, but to stimulate the oxytocin. Once the oxytocin kicks in, then the hind milk can come in. It's so brilliant. Like I, I'm just, it is, it is brilliant. And also the, the other brilliant piece, which you, um, yeah, which you probably know, and maybe you were going to mention it. So sorry if I preempted you, but um, is the oxytocin actually uh, helps shrink the uterus back to its original shape, right? I wasn't so going to say it, so thank you. Everything together. That's great. Yeah, it's all, it's all part of the big plan, you know? It's all <laughs> <laughs> so the baby doesn't even have to suck the hind milk, okay? It will just flow and just, and the baby just has to swallow. So letdown is normally accompanied by a tingling, tingling sensation or a rush of warmth, and it occurs in both breasts simultaneously, so beware of leaking of the other breast. Uh, another reason for giving urtica RNs is that there are no characteristic symptoms other than the fact that the milk flow is scanty and there is no letdown happening. It is like a go-to remedy. You want to use it in the early days of feeding to establish your milk supply. So if you're right off the bat not having a good milk supply, don't wait and say, oh, it's because it's just starting, da, da, da. Like really hit it hard because you want to make sure you establish a good milk supply. And because it's a nettle, you can also drink it as a tea. So you can do kind of both simultaneously. And uh, not surprising in homeopathy, a lot of our remedies have polarities. Sometimes it's used for this side of the, the equation and the other side of the equation. So uh, Artica Arons can be used in a, skilt, in a scanty milk flow, but it could also be used for an, an overabundant milk supply. Now, what is this one? Calcarea carbonica. I always used to think of it as it's a mineral remedy, but it's an animal remedy because it's made from oysters. Uh, in this case, the breast will be very full and possibly even sore. But despite that, only a little bit of watery, blue, milky kind of fluid comes out. And it tends to disagree with the baby. So the baby's like, <laughs> you know, really when he wants it. And then it comes out, it's like, Bleh, you know, they kind of push away. Okay. And it also can be used in an overabundant supply, not surprisingly with the, the breasts that are full. Uh, a person who needs calc carb often tends to be chilly and they often tend to, you know, they tire up pretty easily and they can be quite sweaty. Uh, they could also be very anxious about their health. They could be fearful and they could be sluggish. So these are some of the concomitant symptoms that give you a more totality of the picture of somebody who might need calc carb. But think about it with that watery, bluish, not pleasant tasting uh, uh, milk that comes out. That's a very good indication for calc carb. And I've been talking about Sakali all night, but you didn't get a chance to look at it. This is what it looks like. In this case, the characteristic symptom is that there's a stinging kind of pain in the breasts with a very low milk supply and the breasts remain small. So remember with calc carb, the breasts actually got quite large. In this case, the breasts remain quite small. And the mom is exhausted with severe after pains. Now let's go to the situation where you have a profuse flow of milk, okay? So having a lot of milk is actually like a bit of a luxury, right? But it can overwhelm the baby at the beginning of feeding, right? This poor little baby and you get this huge outpouring of, of milk and it can cause them to choke or it could fill them up too much with each feeding and it can make them feel very uncomfortable. So in that case, you might see gulping, which means that air is swallowed and that could lead to cramping and colic. So for many moms, this is a temporary problem as the milk supply will tend to even out by about eight weeks. But it is something, you know, it could be a problem for the baby and it could be, you, you know, you're wondering why my baby is colicky or gassy and it could simply be because of the overabundance of milk. So in that case, you want to kind of slow things down a little bit. So belladonna actually, actually is a very good remedy for this. But what you want to see in this case is that the breasts are engorged and they're hard, they're red, they're hot and they can become inflamed and painful when the milk comes in. That's a very good indicator. Not surprisingly for people who've used belladonna before, for people with a fever, 
right? That there's the one side of the face is red and the feet are cold and, you know, and it's throbbing and intense and radiating and the redness. So it's the same thing in the breast. There is that throbbing pain. And often you will have these red streaks that radiate out from radiate out from the nipple, almost like a sun, but it's not always the case. So don't use that as a reason not to give belladonna. Then we have pulsatilla once again. That's when there's pain in the breast when the baby nurses, which is not surprising uh, in this case, if it's engorged especially. And it's also used to stop milk flow at weaning. So when you're uh, uh, in the, in the I think in both cases, Belladonna, you're actually going to have some pain as well if, you're, if your uh, breast is. But if you're not seeing the hard, red, engorged, inflamed, painful, but you're still having pain when the baby is nursing, that could be an indication for pulsatilla. Now we have Bryonia. It's a remedy we haven't talked about yet tonight. So it's a beautiful plant. In this case, the breasts become engorged, hard, hot, inflamed, and painful, just like belladonna. So how are we gonna know when to give one and not the other? In this case, remember the belladonna breast was very red. In this case, the bryonia breast can actually be quite pale in color. And also the big hallmark of bryonia is worse any kind of movement. So you have the mom who always wants to wear the bra because she doesn't want her breasts hanging out there, right? She can't move in bed. Every, you know, even picking the baby up, it hurts. Any kind of movement aggravates. That is a perfect indication for bryonia. And our last topic of the night is mastitis. Not a very pleasant situation. Is it our last one? There might be two. I have to remember. Uh, mastitis is a black, a block duck that can lead to it. So it's best to clear it up quickly with very prompt treatment. Obviously, this is an acute situation. You don't want to let it get any worse than it is because it can be extremely painful and it will it cause you to not want to breastfeed and then your milk doesn't come in and it's just a whole chain of events that you don't want to have happen. So first signs could be like a soreness and a lump in the breast. It could be with redness. It could be without redness. It could be on the skin above the lump. Uh, and uh, fever is also a very good indication when you have an abscess, especially that you now have mastitis. Itis means inflammation of, and itis is often accompanied by fever. It's the body's way of letting you know that there is like help is on the way and they're going to the inflamed area and they're bringing up a fever in order to help you heal. Okay. But you have to deal with this fever. So um, if you do have the book, read Miranda's do and don't list. It starts on page 117 and it has very, very good advice about what to do, uh, not just homeopathically, but when you're having a mastitis situation, for example, don't wear a bra that might be cutting into the breast and causing a block duct. So she's got all sorts of very good handy information and tips like that. Robin, we do have a question about Sakali, just harking back to your your other topic. Um, however, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Maybe you do. So the question is, uh, does Sakali help in increasing breast size too? There are many women anxious about it. I have no idea. <laughs> mm. You know, it's funny, you're bringing to mind um, Galvard Galvardin, who was a homeopath in the 19th century, and maybe even into the 20th in France. And he tried to do homeopathy for all sorts of like cosmetic situations. Like if your derriere is too big and you want to make it small, right. oh, I immediately oh, thought I the Galavardin when you said that. So uh, you got me. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> yeah. And, and I always think homeopathy really works with the body's ability to heal itself. Like the body's always trying to heal. You know, if it's out of balance, it's always trying to find that homeostatic balance again. So homeopathy really just kickstarts that natural rebalancing ability that the body has. So I'm not really sure um, that it can help increase breast size, but maybe verbally just, you know i mean you know and then just normal life events uh, you know often having babies will increase the the milk the breast and then yeah some people it gets smaller for some people it stays larger getting older putting on weight right. i mean these are natural ways to do it but in terms of homeopathy i'm sorry yeah. nobody's ever asked me that question it's a great question well, hopefully that answers the question thank <laughs> you Robin. It does, but i'm sorry <laughs> 
It's a great, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> it is. I want to go out and study that. So maybe next time I'll have an answer for you. <laughs> All right. So some mastitis remedies, we'll think to phytolacca is a very, very important remedy uh, during childbirth as well with lots of radiating pains. So let's see if we have them here as well. It's the first remedy to think of in mastitis. It's almost like a go-to remedy. Most women will need phytolacca if they have mastitis. Okay. In this case, the breasts are inflamed, they're lumpy, and they're abscess. Now, what, what do I mean by actual or threatened? It means that you might actually have an abscess in the brain, or in the brain, in the breast, or you could see it's coming. It's just, it's, mm. you feel it, it's starting to get inflamed and heavy and irritated and all that. So that's what we mean by threatened abscess. The pain begins at the beginning of feeding. So that's a very good differentiating symptom because for some people, beginning of feeding will be absolutely fine. And it's only when it comes to the end, just like when we have a cystitis, for some people, the burning, let's say have, they have a burning sensation, it'll happen at the beginning of urination and last throughout. For some people, they'll be absolutely fine, but at the close of the urination, it will start to burn. So very similar in this case with the mastitis, the pain in this case begins at the beginning of feeding. And as I said, with phytolica, it's known for this radiating pains, right? So um, I always think of phyto, like fly, fi, I, I don't know. I have all these crazy ways of remembering stuff. So it rhymes with fly. That's how I remember. So phytolica, it, it radiates from the nipple to the rest of the body. So it starts at the nipple and then it radiates to the rest of the body down and around and all that. That's a beautiful indication mm -hmm. for phytolica. And there could be a lot of restlessness from the inflammation. And don't say that that's nor Of course there is. Who wouldn't if they're feeling bad? Not every, some people will become yeah. completely prostrate and just need to lie down. So this restlessness is a characteristic symptom. Yeah. Yeah. Bryonia, for instance, if they had mastitis, they would want to be absolutely still, right? Or exactly. bonding the breast. Yeah. Don't move me one centimeter. Pulsatilla once again. Now in this case, Block ducts are often due to mechanical pressure, for example, of bra, all right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's not a good situation if you're both a bryonia and a, and a pulsatella where you want to wear the wire bra because you don't want the, your breast to move, but then the, the breast itself is being impinged upon by the bra and, and causing this blockage. Remember, your breast can get super big. <laughs> <laughs> remember waking up in a cantaloupe <laughs> patch one morning <laughs> I know I did so like wow so you're you know it's heavy and you're not used to it and you're going to want to wear something to give you some support but if you're wearing something that's too tight it can actually cause a blockage and lead to a mastitis so be very very careful and again with pulsatilla as always the the nature of the pain can and the location of the pain and the reaction to the pain all of that can be shifting so that's the changeableness of pulsatilla can be seen here as well and once again they want to be sympathy they're better in the open air they're worse in the warm room all that kind of stuff we've talked about several times tonight uh, silica, again, we looked at that again, not surprising we're going to see it here because we saw it before if abscesses were being formed and with a mastitis there can be an abscess, so not surprising that silica shows up here. Uh, in this case, it might be indicated when there is a chronic or a recurrent um, mastitis with ulcers. So you have a woman who every time I have a baby, I get mastitis. That's a good indication for silica. And it's accompanied, this is that concomitant I was talking about. It's, con it's accompanied by ulcers. The breast can be lumpy, hard. The nipples can be bleeding and cracked and they might be inverted. Isn't that a great one? So if a lot of us know silica to give, if you get like a splinter, we take silica to push something out of the body. Well, in this case, the nipples have become inverted. And so you want the silica to bring the nipples back out from the in inverted position. In this case, there can be slowly forming and separating abscess, abscesses. And we talked again about silica being a great remedy when you have these injuries or these events that are happening and they're not healing quickly. Yeah. Uh, and then when you're trying to get a rounded totality of symptoms, they're often very worse cold air and they're better with heat. There's a whole bunch of, I'm obviously giving you practically nothing in terms of the totality of symptoms of uh, silica, but just thought I'd give you a little bit because you wanna know what is making the pain of the mastitis better. You wanna know if putting a cold application is going to make it better or a warm application, uh, wrapping it or not wrapping it. So that is a very good way of differentiating among the remedies. Yeah. 
And then here's one we haven't talked about yet, uh, laconitum. And yes, it's made from the milk of a dog. Now, a very characteristic keynote symptom of laconitum is these uh, pains that alternate sides. It's one way to remember that it goes from, it started on the right, went to the left, went to the left, went back to the right. That is uh, the mastitis of laconitum. They are worse being jarred. So just like stepping down off the curb, you know, causes it to hurt a lot. And there could be a lot of prostration and weakness for somebody who needs laconitum. And they, it's also can be used to uh, dry up milk. So it has multiple purposes. Hmm. Oh, I was right. There was one more time. One more. Okay, last one, last one. Sore cracked nipples. Uh, this tends to happen more in women who have sensitive nipples in general. Uh, so they might be uh, susceptible to it. They'll know this about themselves. Like for example, during lovemaking or rubbing against clothes, they notice that their nipples are particularly sensitive. So they're particularly sense, uh, susceptible to developing this situation. Okay, so we talked about phytolaca. Uh, so we're gonna talk about it again. Now in this case, it's almost a specific for sore cracked nipples when the pain radiates from the nipple all over the body. So we saw that in the mastitis before, right? We saw that phytolaca radiating from, so that's, it's not enough just to have the cracked nipples. You also wanna have that radiating pain. And then we have borax. I'm just giving you kind of like some quick and dirties and some characteristic symptoms. Right. Borax is a great remedy for thrush. A lot of people have given it to their babies for thrush. Uh, the babies have difficulty, you know, if you, you play with them and you could try to go down and they, they go kind of crazy. They don't like uh, changing their position. That's a very yeah. good indication for borax. So in this case, the pain is in the opposite breast to the one being fed on. Isn't that a great characteristic mm -hmm. symptom? So you're, you, you would think the pain would right. be on the one, but it's, it's yeah. the other one. So that's a great way to Great know. symptom. Yeah. And you can have aching breasts even after the feeding is over. And then here's one we haven't talked about, castor equi. This is a, uh, a remedy that it almost is only used for one thing. And it is for this. It's indicated for women who have no other symptoms. It's called a near specific. So you don't have any concomitants and you don't have any mental stuff and emotional stuff and radiating pains and changeability and all that. You might want to just try some castor equi. Okay. And it's made from the thumbnails of the horse. And it really has no other application in homeopathy. And in that way, it's almost similar to urtica arens, that nettle that I showed you before, because for scanty milk, it's almost a near specific uh, for moms who have practically no other symptoms, or there's no other obvious way to narrow it down to, uh, to another remedy through characteristic symptoms. And sometimes you'll have a mom come to you and it's like, and she's familiar with homeopathy. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to tell you. It's just there. And I have no reason. Well, then think to cast your equi, you know? Help is on the way. The breast might be engorged and the skin might be itchy, but these are like kind of, you know, we're kind of stretching, look, trying to find some other symptoms to go with it. Uh, and they often can't tolerate clothing near their nipples, but I don't think that's a particular, I mean, I just, this is what I found in the Materia Medica, but you know, anybody who's got cracked itch, you know, uh, painful breasts, nobody's going to want to have a lot of clothes near their nipples. So I, you know, and then we have sulfur, right? Uh, that's a, a very, very common remedy. It's almost, you know, forbidden to be given sulfur because there's so many uh, um, symptoms associated with sulfur that it's almost overused, but it is a very good remedy for uh, cracked nipples because it has a very specific sensation. Sulfur has a very well-known sensation and that is this burning after nursing. So the nipples are cracked and they're sore with itching and burning after nursing. You want to think to sulfur. Now the inflammation can run in radii and lines from the nipple to the periphery. So that's very similar. We saw that with belladonna. We saw that in terms of pain from phytolaca. So in this case, the inflammation can run like, you know, like radiating um, uh, lines from the nipple to the periphery. And the baby often rejects the milk that tastes spoiled. We saw that with calc carb right? Uh, when, the, when the milk was uh, thin and watery and blue. In this case, uh, the milk it normally would taste fine, but it, it starts to taste spoiled to the patient. And when you think of sulfur, what is sulfur when you burn it? It smells like poo, right? It smells very, very bad. Yeah, so, very so sulfury, that, like egg. Yeah. And so, the, and so the baby rejects the milk, it tastes spoiled. Now, other things that you can do besides the remedies that we've told you about, 
uh, you can use external creams. Okay, so check Miranda's, uh, it's called her external materia medica. It's in the back of the book and her repertory for details. And then just experiment until you find one that works for you. And they may not all work, so just experiment. But she finds that calendula and that rescue remedy creams tend to, in cream form tend to be the most helpful. I don't, does rescue remedy come in cream? Maybe it does. So that's very interesting. Yeah. And, and, and what's also good about it is that it's helpful to the baby, right? Because the baby might get very fussy. You know, th there could be a tension in the mother as she brings to the baby because she knows it's gonna hurt. The baby anticipates that and they start getting anxious. So if you can use some rescue remedy, not only are you attenuating all the stuff around your nipple, but you're also treating the baby with a little bit of anxiety, you know, attenuating uh, remedy. You wanna rub it in after a feed Otherwise, you want to rub a little expressed milk into your nipple. So if you don't have any of these creams, yeah. use your expressed milk around your nipples to cut. And it's nice and cool and let it air dry. And uh, that can help to cure it as well. Oh, I'm done. Oh, great. Um, there was a comment, actually. Yes, there is rescue remedy in a cream. Excellent. So, Thank you yeah, for listening. So that's good to know. And lanolin, right? Isn't it lanolin cream? Yeah. Isn't that, um, yeah, often used for that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a mm -hmm, very you want to make sure you're giving something that the baby can eat if, if, yeah. if it goes. So you only want to use these natural kind of creams. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm loving yeah. the idea of the rescue remedy because I love, you know, two for one. Yeah, you know? great. Wonderful. What going to be doing next week? She's going to, just like I did birth complaints and postnatal, she's going to do labor pain and emotions and exhaustion. And then she'll do in mom's healing after labor. That's a big topic. And mental emotion and exhaustion as well. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm done. Fabulous. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're getting lots of uh, thank you, thank you, thank yous. And uh, I just want to add very quickly, briefly at the end, just remember that our organization for Homeopathy Canada is, you know, we're, we're here to support homeopaths and, and homeopathy for you to use remedies at home, uh, or if you're a homeopath to help support uh, the, all the work that you do. So please, you know, share our information on social media. If you have a testimonial, please tell us your story uh, and uh, really helps us get the work out there that we do as homeopaths. Um, I, I think I mentioned in the beginning, maybe not, maybe it was last time, Robin and I just do what we do because we love homeopathy. We don't get paid for this. So uh, please, you know, if you can donate, it's just $10 a month to become a member or $120 a year. Um, that's the price of like two lattes or something like that. Right, Robin? <laughs> so, uh, a really fancy place. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we really, really do appreciate your support. And anything that you can give goes to the very basics runnings of the uh, of, of our organization and just getting all the work that we do out there. So... Uh, is there anything I've forgotten? I think that's I pretty think that's it. Let me go on to the next slide. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, so that's the membership you were just talking about. So I think we're done. Yeah, good. Um, we had another comment that I just have to share here. It's um, from um, uh, someone from India. It was fantastic session worth waking up early in the morning for 4.30 a.m. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Oh thank you for joining us and do remember that you can always watch these uh, on the uh, for homeopathycanada.org website and um, just click on the webinars section and you'll see all these uh, not live but you know after the fact but we always love it when you come live because then we get questions and it just makes it so much more interesting don't you think Robin oh and I wish you guys would talk more <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your well, share. You can put it into the chat. I see hardly anybody talked in the chat. I mean, we've all, you know, if if we've given birth, you know, and you want to share your experience. Absolutely. You we, we would be so happy to share your story and talk about it with everybody. Yeah, that sounds lovely. Wonderful. Well, it's been fun, Robin. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Nicole, for your fabulous support. <laughs> Fabulous moderating. Thank you, as always, my partner in crime.
<laughs> and I look forward to uh, when is our next session? I, I forgot to mention it, I think, or maybe you did. Well, let me go. I can go back to that. Um, let me see. Let me get a, uh, let's see. I'll go back to this slide here. Okay. Can everybody great. see that? Wonderful. Yes. Well, great. Yeah. So we two weeks, two short weeks. Mm hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. So our next session is July 28th at the same time. And uh, yeah, lots of thank yous. Very informative, Robin. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the other sessions and always looking forward to having you all join us again. Yes. Yeah. Please come. We have so much. <laughs> all right. You have a good evening. Good night, everybody. I'll see you in two weeks. Nicole is going to be her usual fabulous self. We're going to have a <laughs> time. Um, and uh, bring your questions, bring your friends, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. All right. All right. Good bye, night, everybody. everybody. I'm going to end the bye. session if I can bye, figure bye, it out. Bye, Robin. Bye, honey. Take care. There we go. I'm going to end the meeting. Take, take care, everybody. Bye.